All right, in this general tab, I just want to talk about that second round of depression I went through. Um, I, knew, I had a first round of depression. I knew the second one was going to come one day. I'm going to talk fast because this is a long video. But I knew I couldn't have a gun. Uh, so I had been, uh, people had tried to give me guns during Christmas or birthday presents. And I've always had to like give them to my brother or, or something. And no, I don't want guns. I can't have guns. And I knew that I couldn't because during the second round of depression, if I had a gun, I would have killed myself. My body would have reacted. My mind would have said stop, but my body would have done it anyway. And I know this. Uh, so I couldn't have a gun. Once I made it through that second round of depression, now it's not a problem at all. I can still carry license, all that kind of stuff. It's not a problem. Uh, but for that second round of depression, this was about March of 1997. Um, there was a lot of workplace stress going on at the time. A whole lot. If you saw my descriptions, a lot of workplace stress. Also at the time, I did have a best friend. A lot of my videos are talking about not having friends. Well, I did have one best friend. When I moved to the DFW area out of college, I reconnected with someone I had known in college and we became drinking buddies, uh, best friend drinking buddies. And that lasted for a good 15, 20 years. So I did have a best friend and that was nice. He did not know about the strange happening side of me. Um, he couldn't have dealt with it. Most Nobody can deal with it, honestly. I'm just now putting it out there, but nobody can deal with it. Uh, uh, anyway, Around that time, uh, he had gone through a divorce. Uh, his wife wanted to divorce him. She wanted to be free and move on. I think she's been married like four other times, including to a relative, uh, kind of odd. But anyway, I supported him through the divorce and he needed some support. Um, and so I supported him. And around March of 1997, no, it was, it was before March of 97, it was probably uh, March of 1996 around there that this was happening. And around that time, uh, he needed you know, a lot of support. And I was given that. Then I started realizing I was in love with the guy. I loved the guy. I really did. I still don't understand why people limit themselves to half the population on love. I still don't get that. Um, it's just inconceivable to me. I don't understand it. Um, anyway, but I loved him. Uh, I really did. And I told him this one day when we were just sitting alone on the couch. Um, and he could not handle it. I'm sure he saw the gay side of me and always had. And uh, when I told him that, it did not go over well. Uh, it was pretty much disgust, and I can see in his head, I could see that's what it was. It was disgust, and it was pure disgust. Um, later on, I even mentioned this to him. I said, every time I see you, I'm seeing, uh, what you're seeing is, I'm seeing disgust in you when you look at me, and he didn't deny it. Uh, so it was there. It was absolutely there. This went on for about a year, and I uh, tr you know, tried to be normal friends like uh, I had before, supported him, anything he needed, I was there. I was jumping on it. I'd be there for him whenever he needed anything. Whenever I needed anything, He'd say yes and then not show up. My wife and I would invite him out to dinner or whatever on a weekend or do something on a weekend. He'd say yes, then five, ten minutes before time to show up. He called, said he had to do laundry or something trivial. It was really nothing to it. Uh, so that was uh, a bit downer. And it got to the point uh, toward the end of that year where we would invite him. He'd say yes, and we would go ahead and make plans with other people for that exact same time, knowing he would cancel, and he did every single time, never failed. Uh, so it did get to the point, it's like, he is totally disgusted with me, I cannot be around him anymore, for the benefit of both of us, really. He needed to move on with his life, uh, and I needed him out of my life. So one day, I had to uh, cut it off, and uh, I talked to him, uh, and fell apart, and told him, you know, what's happening? And said, done, this friendship is over. It's done. There is no friendship left here. And from this moment on, I don't want to see or hear from him again. And I had to cut it off instantly, sharp. And so I did. And that killed me. That was really, really hard. Uh, it was extremely hard. And I might could have dealt with that by itself, but along with the workplace stress that was under, both of those things hitting at the same time. And then dealing with this and, and telling him to get out of my life, all this negative stuff from that first depression came slamming back at me. Everything hates me, blah, blah, blah. It all came slamming back like a fist. Personally, I, I think part of the problem too was I had gotten, I mentioned in the other video how easy it would be for me to become an arrogant, um, arrogant, aggressive asshole. And I think I was turning into that. I was letting some of these strange happenings take over at work because there was so much workplace stress going on. I was starting to use it and using it more and becoming, abusing it more. And becoming more arrogant with it. And it was working. It was it was doing stuff. And I was doing things. And that's how I could do all this work that was going on, was using it. Um, and so I was abusing it and uh, being more arrogant with it and using it in ways that I shouldn't be using it. A lot of personal gain, that sort of thing, and which is really just wrong. 
And so I was doing some bad things with it, uh, some dark things with it, and I really shouldn't have been doing that, and I was. And I think that was, I was being slapped down for it by karma, or whatever you want to call it. Uh, this was a, turning into a slap down on me, um, because I had done some things that were not great, and um, I was being slapped down for it. And it came with a fist, and it slapped me down hard, and I fell apart, completely fell apart. I put my head on my wife's lap, broke apart in my mind what I'm, I mean fell apart literally just fell apart just lost it and what I saw in my mind was my soul exploded joy hate love caring happiness everything shattered into a million pieces and went flying out and from that moment on when I wake up in the morning I was crying how can I kill myself and not make my wife sad and that's the only reason I did not kill myself was that one little fingernail thought of how can I do it and not make my wife sad? Not devastated, not financially in a bind, not anything. Forget family, forget friends, forget the world. That one little thought, how can I kill myself and not make her sad? If I kill myself, she will be sad. How can I do it so she's not sad? That was it. That was the only thing left. And I couldn't figure it out. And that's the only reason I'm alive today, because I couldn't figure it out. Huh? So she wouldn't be sad. Just sad. Nothing else. Which is sad in itself, but that's it. Just, you know just sad. So that was every morning waking up uh, at lunch. Every still moment it was that, how can I kill myself? Suicide, big time. How can I kill myself? Not make her sad. At lunch, driving home, crying at night before going to sleep. How can I kill myself and not make her sad? Um, peeing in, the, in, in a urinal in a restroom. How can I kill myself? Not make her sad. So every day was an eternity Every single day was eternity because every still moment, just every single still moment, it was suicide. How can I do this? Every single still moment. The problem is I had that one little thought and I wanted to try to save myself instinctively and not kill myself. So I put that thought in a cage internally, trying to protect itself. This one little piece of humanity left, I put it in this cage <laughs> and nothing else around. Beam of light on a cage, darkness all around. And that was a way of trying to protect that one little thought uh, from everything coming at, at me. Because I had a lot of stuff coming at me at the time. Uh, and it wasn't just work stress or this, this first depression coming in and hit me like a fist. If you've seen some of my strange happenings about coincidences in the past, all those coincidence things turned dark and went negative and started hitting me at the same time. So a lot of coincidences and strange things just went dark and were just hammering me and hammering on me the whole time. During this time, things such as, let me give you a couple examples. Uh, during that time, um, Matthew Shepard was killed. A young gay boy, um, two people got him, tied him to a fence post, poured gas on him, lit him on fire. Um, they left, didn't kill him. And he was left uh, with all of his burns all over his body, exposed to the elements, and exposure is what killed him after all that burns. And that came on, and so that was hitting me. Like I said, all this gay side had come up, so that, and he was gay, and all this, and this is the way the world wants to treat you, kind of thing. Also, at the same time, the West, uh, Westboro church people that were picketing, going to funerals with signs up, God hates fags, all this kind of stuff, all this horrible negative stuff from religion. So the religion piece came back and was hitting me. Every single thing, all of these coincidences went negative. Everything went negative in the world and was hitting me. And I was just trying to survive through all that. And I couldn't do it. I couldn't break myself out of it. Um, the one thing I'd done to try to make an escape clause kind of is my that little piece I locked in a cage. The key was anybody just need to ask, are you okay? That's all I needed was somebody ask if I was okay. And if so anybody, anybody asked that, then I'd open up and all this would be, a, I could talk about it and get over it. And this time of thing, the problem is I'm a master of deception by this point for hiding all the strange happening stuff. I knew how to manipulate people and steer people in a direction. And when I locked up that last piece of humanity in me, all the strange part of me, since I was being an arrogant, aggressive asshole, turned on maximum. It went to maximum. And I was manipulating, pushing people around so nobody saw it. Actually, it was such a, that strange happening part of me went to such an extreme, people really liked me that way, that I was suicidal. They could not see it whatsoever. They liked me to, to the point of, 
the operations department at Bell Helicopter gave me this. Uh, so six months after that started, they gave me this, September 1997. It's an Operations Peer Recognition Award. They never give it to uh, anybody in safety. It's something they started up. Usually they give it to each other, that sort of thing, within operations. I'm outside operations, and they gave it to somebody in safety. Insane. Because what I had done at that point is I had turned everything on. Any manager, anybody needed report, I'd have it written and ready and handed it to them. Whenever they asked for it, I'd have it already printed out and hand it to them. And man, I was going, I had several bosses and I was doing this constantly. I'd be walking down an aisle, the strange happenings, knowing if there's a problem kind of thing. I'd be walking down an aisle, stop, go to the employee and say, is there a problem with your machine right here with this part of it? And they'd say, yes, let me get it fixed. I'll get it fixed for you so it doesn't cause an injury. And I was doing that right and left, just walking down the aisle, there's a problem, there's a problem, there's a problem, fix this, fix that, fix this, fix that, before it happened. And the employees saw this, and they liked it a lot. They liked what I was doing, because I was getting stuff done before they even brought it up to their bosses, or brought it up to maintenance, or brought it up to anybody. I'd recognize it and fix it. They liked it, so this. The problem with this nowadays is, it's. I guess you call it bittersweet. This is probably uh, the best word I'll ever get in my life. It was amazing. Uh, all the operations, the regular shop floor workers gave this to somebody in safety, really. And the problem is, they really like me suicidal. So it's a very positive thing and at a very negative time in my life. So I just put it in a file and lock it away. It's just another piece of paper because it's so extreme for me now. Like I said, I locked this piece away. Uh, during this, every day is a negative. And this went on for six months. So every day is eternity. Every single day is eternity. And it went on for six months for a very, very long time. Six months is a long time when every day is an eternity. I could not get myself out of it whatsoever. That little piece locked in a cage, beating against the bars. My, in my mind, I'm seeing this picture in my mind throughout the six months, getting bloody, getting beaten, bruised down. I can't really move anymore. I'm finally not able to even scream anymore in, in, in that little cage. Uh, get out. I lay down. The body died. It finally got so old after a six months period. It's turning to dust, blew away. The cage turned to dust, blew away. There's nothing left but a light beam in darkness. And that was me at six months. Uh, so I was done and burned up and gone. Uh, so I there was nothing left. Honestly, I could not get out of it and nobody was going to help me get out of it um, because I was so good um, at what I was doing. So uh, what happened one day, uh, the way I got out of it, uh, others helped me out of it, uh, an outside force, these strange happenings type entities that are out there. I hadn't even talked about any of this that I talked to. They took action on their own and got me out of it because nobody else could, no human could. Um, Actually, I read up on this, uh, the soul shattering thing. It's a Native American Indian term, soul shatter. Apparently they have a term for this. When that explosion like that happens and you see it in your mind, they call it a soul shatter and you don't survive it unless you get outside help. Problem with me is I, my outside help, what didn't come from humans, didn't come from people, it came from these other entities out there. I was driving home from work at this when this uh, thing happened. I was driving home from work, had a Ford Ranger, uh, Manual steering, just manual steering with tie rods and things, not automatic transmit, not automatic steering, manual stick shift, and old Ford Ranger driving, and the tie rods broke on my truck. I was on a bridge, going over a creek, oncoming traffic, it's rush hour, my tie rods broke, and my steering wheel just turned free. There, I have zero control over steering, none. In my truck just drifted into oncoming traffic. It just drifted head on into the other lane into oncoming traffic. And I had zero control. Before I could even hit the brakes uh, good, I'm within feet of a straight, I mean, not even glancing blow angle to a car, you know, bumpers touch a little bit. No, head on. I'm in the middle of their lane, head on, straight full head on, feet from another car in some force pushes my truck sideways. I mean, against the tires, sideways. My whole truck just goes sideways into my own lane and my front wheels straighten up. And there's a slight little curve to the left past the bridge. And so I'm able to put on the brake, slow down, and let my truck drift off the side of the road. And that was enough of an impact in my psyche to snap me out of it. And I was able to start 
getting a grip again. Like this is so extreme, so unbelievable, so incredible, so far out there that it was able to snap me out of this uh, depression and allow me to take another step forward and start getting out of this a little bit and start rebuilding my life again. And so that's what it took. The others took action, pushed my entire truck sideways against the tires. Then my um, front tires went straight and I was able to drift off the side of the road. That was the last time I had that truck. I drove that truck. I got rid of it instantly. No more of that truck. But um, I know it was a good thing that uh, somebody else took action. Some other things took action on my behalf. Otherwise, I wouldn't be here. But now that that's all over, I know it's over. It won't happen again. Um, I'm okay. And I was able to put that behind me. But that was another instance of something really strange and extreme because it took it to break me out of this depression.